Hey, welcome back. And in this video today, I'm gonna to show you how I cast this hand wheel here through the lost foam casting process. This process starts with one inch pink foam that I purchased from the local hardware store. Eventually, I'm gonna laminate a second surface on behind this to get the other half of the hand wheel on it. The program that I'm using on my router is Mach 3 and it's been very successful for my application. As for the 3D programming, I use Vetric Expire. Now this is a really powerful program that I found quite easy to use and there's lots of videos on the internet to learn how to use it. I simply took a picture of my logo and put it on top of everything and then just basically turned it into a 3D mold. Now that we have the mold done, which is more complicated than needed, I'll spray it with a soapy solution. Now the soapy solution is simple. Just put water in a bottle and then take regular dish soap as seen here and then just add a liberal amount till it colors it. Conveniently, this can also be used as leak detector in the shop as well. Now I did have a comment from one of my viewers and he does lost foam casting as well and he said that I need to thin down the plaster a little bit for my next video. And in my next videos, I will thin it down and give it a whirl. This still does work out, but I need to make sure that I dry it for ample amount of time to make sure there's no moisture in this mold at all. I did find I had some air bubbles still hiding underneath. So I run the brush just over the top to find any of the bubbles that were missed. And if you look at the final casting, you'll notice I still did miss a few bubbles. So I think I'm going to try thinning it down next time and seeing if that makes a difference. Now next, I'm just going to hang it up in the wood shop and I'll leave it out there for two or three days to make sure it's good and dry. Now that it's dry, we're going out to the shop and we're going to cast this. If you haven't guessed it yet, this is Canada and it's winter time and it's not really that great for casting but I'm not gonna lie weather stop me from casting unless it's raining. I think this would be a great time to tell you that I am NOT a professional foundryman nor do I profess to be one. So as for safety you need to do your own research and figure out what's safe for you and what works for you. Speaking of safety you're probably noticing the metal pail that I'm using now a big thanks to Richard and Theron for getting me some metal pails. Richard purchased these down to Princess Auto and Theron grabbed me some from his local mechanic shop and I really appreciate that from both you guys. Now let's get back to business. I really didn't need this complicated gating system. Now with this recip saw technique that I'm going to use, it packs the sand down pretty tight and it never did end up burning out the vents that were supposed to be there. So I think in my next casting, I'm not going to put this complicated vents in. Now you notice some chunkies in there and I probably should have worked a little harder not to have them. But this casting does work out, I assure you. On previous attempts, I just let the edge of the recip saw vibrate against it. But this time I'm just letting the recip saw actually hit the pail. Now it's denting the pail a little bit, but it creates a better frequency and it seems to settle out the sand a lot faster and a lot better for this situation. You'll notice now that the sand that I'd started with is going down a bit and it's almost like the foam starting to float in the sand and come up just millimeters. So we're going to pour this on top, chunkies and all, and we're going to vibrate this down again. Now back to Steve Zuraid's method with using the soup cans. I've tried a few different methods. I've tried the foam cup, and I've tried the Coke can, which I thought was like a super duper improved version. But really, the soup cans is the way to go because I don't need to pack the sand quite as deep. And they peel off quite easy, and there's usually a lot of them laying around. Yeah, when you build things, you have problems. Yeah, the foundry's not working right which ended up me pouring this a little bit cooler today, but it still did work out. The reason for this was the nozzle was all plugged up. In the last stretch of minus 30 degrees Celsius weather we had, I broke a line when moving something around on the foundry. And I replaced it with the junky old line that I had sitting behind the shop, and there was garbage in it, and it plugged everything up. What's that saying? 1090? Spend 10% of your time solving 90% of your problems? Well, not this time. But we did get it working later that week. This is running about 720, 725 when I measured it, and I'm just going to go for it anyways.
I did get lucky here if you notice that it almost stopped pouring there, but I still had enough head pressure that it didn't wreck anything. Full disclaimer here too, you need to wear a respirator if you're going to attempt this, and full safety gear. Incomplete combustion of polystyrene creates all kinds of bad toxic fumes. So having a nice wind blowing the smoke away from you and wearing the correct safety gear is instrumental in the success and longevity of your life. is that is exciting that is super exciting now let's take a close look at it these are what the air bubbles look like when it doesn't quite coat it quite right but this is still a win and very salvageable let's clean it up a little bit quick and see how quick it cleans up with a wire wheel I've got a few ideas how we can make this really pop after we polish it up. Now, my first step was to give it a light coat of paint on the background, and this worked out quite well. It gave it a little bit of a translucent, almost, almost anodized kind of look. Yes, I'm going to anodize some stuff a little bit later on, but that's going to be in summertime when I work outside. I think to do this project again, I should have machined it first and then gone through this process because I had to protect it while I was machining it later on. The next method is new to me, and I thought it was a great idea. I take some two-part epoxy and mix in some dye with it. Now, finding red dye for epoxy was quite difficult, so I did some research on the internet, and I found out that you can use acrylic paint in a small amount, 10 to 1, to dye your project. Now, some people will weigh their epoxy 50-50. Now, a lot of care is going to need to be taken here. You don't want to whip it and put air into this solution. That's going to leave you with air bubbles you're going to have trouble getting out later. I would recommend applying this with a syringe because it made it a lot easier in the end game of things. Now what I'd highly recommend is to put a level on this before you start doing this. In my case, I didn't, and about a half hour later, I came back to find out my work had tilted over and that it was flowing out a little bit on one side. Luckily, this was easily corrected with a Q-tip, and no one will be the wiser. Now, after I'd put it down, I had to go back of it with the tip of a paintbrush just to push it into some of the corners where it was a little bit resilient of going in. Let's go out to the shop and machine this. First, I'm going to drill and tap the hole the handle that's going to go into this. But like I said earlier, I did this in the wrong order. Now I have to protect all my work. Now one of my cheat methods here, just for quickly identifying threads, is just to grab the tap and then we'll line it up. No need to grab a thread pitch gauge or none of that business. Now, I'm going to center drill it, drill it to size using my drill tap chart. Now I'm going to cheat a little bit here. I simply put the tap in the chuck, 
turn it on and then turn it off and then slowly feed it into the work to let it grab three or four threads. This will give me a perfect perpendicular start to tapping the threads. Now, here comes the important step. The center gauge that I'm using here right now is just to roughly find where to start so I can dial this in. Remember on the machine, the outside of the handle is important to be perfectly round with the center of the shaft. It's not the inside diameter. Now, since I'm not drilling fully through this, I have to be very careful with the height and the depth of my drill bit. Now, for this application, since we're not going all the way through, I'm going to create a thread on the inside of the handle with a shoulder. Then, on the side, since this isn't a high torque situation and I'm already threading it on, I'm going to put in a set screw that's going to fit exactly into the keyway. Once again, it's super important to tap this perpendicular and concentric with the outside of the hand wheel because any deviation, even so minute, you're going to feel while you're operating the handle. Now for cutting in that set screw that I was telling you about. Since this casting was such a delicate casting, I didn't want to hold it in a vise with soft jaws and risk screwing it up. Yeah, there's lots of that. As I was finishing it up, school got out, and I had my apprentice come home and give me a hand with the rest of it. And it went from helping, to supervising, to taking charge and finishing the job. Hey, if you have any suggestions on videos that you'd like to see me do, or some constructive criticism that can make me better and make us all better, please throw it in the comments down below. Also, if you haven't hit subscribe yet and you're new to the channel, don't forget to hit subscribe and maybe the bell button so you get notifications when I put my next videos out. <laughs>